How's everybody doing today? Welcome back. Yes, folks, it's another one of those videos about evil investors, basement dwellers, the beautiful 3% young ladies. And today we're talking about this whole video, one magic card, one little magic card. So we're going to line them up here. We're going to get this little fellow over here with this happy little tree. Please stop looking at my hairy arms. I'm very self-conscious and nervous right now. All right, folks, so let me introduce you all to Second Chance. Urza's Legacy, 1999. First mass-produced set, or standard set, or was it extended? Standard? Whatever the wording was back then. First set that actually had, well, foil cards in it as a regular product. Okay? It is reserve list, and uh, I wish I had that cool of hair. And I think the artwork's amazing. And obviously, in from the infamous Mark T. And uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, foil versions are extremely difficult to get. They are nothing like foils in the year 2020. So these are cards that I'm going to give everybody a fun story time today. Camera's a little off-centered there on the old Seb play map. So essentially, Second Chance is a reserve list card from a million years ago that stayed at about 25 to 50 cents for a very long period of time. We've got near minty ones, we've got played ones in the middle, light played, and the whole shebang here. I'd say probably around 100, 150 copies of the card. Um, I completed this transaction with a gentleman here in Florida. And uh, this gentleman was uh, an investor. He specced on the card. And, um, you know, he bought all these cards a couple years ago. I think his cost basis was around 50 cents a card. Not really that big a deal. Obviously, in 2020, I'm sure most of you are going to pause the video. And you're going to go look at eBay and, you know, or TCG Player, hit near mint, light play, look at the conditions, look at the price ranges, blah, blah, blah. And I'd say the cards are probably, what, five bucks a piece at this point in time? So I made the deal with them, and I bought all the cards for an average price. I think it came out to be two to three fifty, depending on the condition of the card. If it was like real heavy play, it was two bucks. If it was minty, it was like three bucks or something. Whatever the pricing was in buy list, I don't remember what it was. So the gentleman was happy. He bought a bunch of cards for thirty to forty cents, and he flipped them to me a couple years later, and I paid him on average like two fifty a card. So even if he paid fifty cents, sell them to me for two dollars and fifty cents. Well, that's quite a multiplier. That's quite many hundred percent sub three, four, five. That's a nice, uh, it's a nice roll over there. And I paid his shipping fees. So he pretty much just, it was a very risk-free transaction. He had no major issues. He was happy. He moved on. I'm happy because now I have a position. And I have no problem being labeled as the evil investor in 2020. I now have a position in second chance. What am I going to do with the card? I have no idea. I have no plans for it. I'm probably going to lock it up here, throw it in one of the Rudy Volts, and uh, add it to the inventory Excel spreadsheets of my homemade 1997 Office XP high-end version of Excel. Do I think the card's going to continue to go higher? I have no idea. Probably not. Do I think it should go higher? Um, I mean, I could try to pump it and sell it to all of you all and, you know, sell me this pen type thing, but I really, you know, I think it's a cool card. It's a three-drop enchantment when you have low life. You can sack it, you get an extra turn. So, obviously, for light manipulation or kind of those uh, death shadow type of uh, shenanigan type, there's a lot of decks where, you know, low life and kind of plays in your advantage or whatever it is. And, you know, that, that's up to you all. I, I really, whether it goes up or stays the same for a year or five years is kind of indifferent. I just like to build positions in different collectibles. And again, this is from 1999. It will never be reprinted again. And the only variant you have is, of course, the foils up here. And to remind everybody, foils were extraordinarily hard to get. As you can see from the card right here, there were 143 cards in Urza's Legacy, of which about eh, 30 to 40 of those were rares. So let me explain that to you all. In theory, to get one of every foil rare, you would have to open about 40 booster boxes. And that's assuming no anomalies and randomization levels out, which it usually doesn't until a large sample size. So even getting a foil rare of anything from the Urza's block is an extraordinarily difficult task. It's nothing like it is in 2020, where, you know, every box you get four, five, six, seven collector boxes have 10, 15, 20, 30 foil rares and mythics. You know, a foil rare is more rare than any mythic in 2020. So... That's where I kind of stand. I just wanted to share this interesting deal where this uh, this investor sold me their position. And you know what it kind of reminds me of, actually, everybody? Do you guys, do you guys remember? About a year ago, you guys remember this? 
Anybody remember this? Anybody remember what this is? The brick. So this was a similar deal on these type of situations. Anybody remember the Silex? The Silex. Um, antiquities card, reserve list, and uh, an investor kind of sold out their whole position to me. Anybody remember this whole thing? And then I made a follow-up video on it because when we had this new 2020 buyout boom, the prices swung and there was a dramatic uh, difference on that. And this transaction reminds me of this type of transaction. Obviously, an antiquities card versus an Urza's Legacy Rare is nowhere near the same on print run levels and you know, obviously rarities and, you know, power levels and mechanics of the card where this is more of a normal mechanic type card versus destroying everything from an expansion set is obviously a very, very unique mechanic that you'll never, ever see done again. Even if it wasn't reserved list, uh, trying to just remove cards from certain print runs or sets is just not really a realistic situation in 2020 because of all the reprints and crossovers and cards in multiple sets. It'd be way too confusing. And of course, it would change the cards in that set and change the reprints every year with all these different, you know, machine, the printer machine goes burr 24 seven now. So I like, these are the, I really enjoy these type of transactions. This video has no real dramatic purpose, but more so to just kind of show behind the scenes on, you know, the questions I'm going to get, which I want to answer now before we end the video is number one, Rudy, why did you choose to buy out this card or why did you choose to take this position on? And my answer to that question, I got a list of five questions here for you all. Because uh, I already know people ask me every time I do these videos. I get emails and patron messages and comments on it. Uh, one, I didn't buy this position out with any expectation of moving the market or thinking it's going to go higher or lower. I bought it out because I saw an opportunity to get a reserve list card in bulk for a couple dollars. And I still feel the card is at a relatively cheap below market price of what it could be at some point in the future. Whether that's one, five, or ten years. And having a position that doesn't cost very much money that I can lock up and just keep on the books, I feel is a very comfortable feeling. So no, I did not seek out to target this card because I believe it's going to go up. I have no intentions of going on the open market and buying any of this card. I think today's price of the card is actually where it should be. I don't think it should be higher or lower in the short term. I think the price is actually a second chance is where it actually should be. And that's okay. Uh, question number two. Rudy, uh, because of that, do you really film the video and talk about it to try to move the market afterwards? Okay, if you're new to the channel and you're not aware, I don't sell reserve list cards. So even when this card was bought, I bought a whole stack of hundreds of these things, and I paid, what would you remember, was it 3 or $4 a piece? Or is it two fifty for the head? I don't remember. $3, a, three fifty, a card. And now the card is nowhere near three fifty. I still own the entire brick. And I have no intentions of selling. That's not the purpose of what I do. I am obsessed with the cardboard. I am obsessed with the history and the old cards. That is not going to change. In five years on YouTube, it's still the same. And probably by the time I retire on YouTube in a couple more years, it's probably still not going to change. So, no, I didn't do that to try to move the price up. Actually, many times, like I explained to a lot of you longer-term viewers of this channel, you will learn that I actually prefer cars to stay cheap so that I can continue to build to my positions. And for those of you who haven't noticed, when's the last time I bought PSA 10 cards for Alpha? Remember how that was my number one big thing? Well, the market's moved so much, I stopped buying them. I haven't bought any in, God, it's been two years? Maybe? Three years now? No, I think about one and a half to two years. Because the pricing is so extraordinarily, it's just so extraordinarily high. Even if I try to bid on one, I get, I mean, even I'm like, oh, that's a great card, I'll build a thousand bucks. And it'll end at like 5000 And I'm like, well, what am I even doing? So in other words, the only thing that stops me from adding to my position is if the card goes up in price. So you need to understand, for those of you who are not familiar with my perspective on this, I prefer the prices of the old cards to stay the same. I don't like large drops and I don't like large spikes. I like to report on it as a news thing because that's what we do on the Magic Finance and the news channel here. But as far as pricing, as long as I've explained to you guys, same thing with Arabian Nights and Legends and all the revised dual lands you guys have seen in the past, especially two years ago when I went through the Rudy revised dual land God book thing. I will continue to add to positions as long as the card stays cheap. What takes Rudy out of the game is when the prices skyrocket. Okay? So I hope that makes sense. So let me go to uh, question number three. Well, it kind of, that was kind of two and three. Let's go to number four. And question four is, Rudy, do you think the Urs the foils is what it's pretty much going to be? Why didn't you buy many of the foils? Do you think the foils is where the rare money is, if you think it's that rare? Well, 
the foils, well, how do I say this? The foils are simply going to derive their value as a multiplier of the regular card. If this card goes from $5 to $10, the foil is going to go up by a higher multiplier. That's all it is. That's where the term foil multiplier comes in. Back in the day, foil multipliers were extraordinarily large. So, for example, in 2020, if I pull a Zendikar Rising Rare for $1, the Zendikar Rising Foil Rare would probably be like $1.10. Nobody even cares. But back in the day, if you got a dollar rare, the Foil Rare would be like $10. The multiplier would literally be some cheesy 510x, where nowadays it's 0.10x. It's 0.10 type thing. It's literally, you get a 10 to 15% premium for the average rare that's foil versus none. Some of the mythics will have a little bit higher, but overall, that trend holds true for most cards that are not extremely demanded for or having large price movements or what they call very large market variants. Um, so, to answer the question number four here, second chance foil back there. No, I'm not, I really, actually, I think I only have one or two. So, with these four, I may have six foil second chances, which... It's cool. I think they're beautiful. Again, there is no substitute for the old foiling on these cards. It's, it's stunning. And I wouldn't be surprised if they bring some sort of old foiling style back with these Time Spiral remastered and these new throwback things to capitalize on that segment of the market in 2021. So I'm mentally ex preparing and expecting that kind of changes from Wizards of the Money Machine Coast. So, um, to answer your question, everybody, I just like the foils. I don't seek them out. They were part of this deal. Um, should you choose between the foil or the regular, it makes no difference. It just depends on the capital. You put $1,000 in this, you get more copies, but it goes up slower. You put $1,000 in this, you get less copies, but it goes up at a higher rate. So technically, probably like percentage-wise, there's probably not going to be a, a dramatic net difference. But I do want to comment the supply is very low on any Urza's foiling, any of them, especially the rares. Therefore, it's easy to manipulate the market if someone out there was looking to buy out some sort of Urza's foil rare. Now, again, I'm still not a huge fan of old foils and foil investing. Uh, maybe some exceptions of like the reserveless foils and like 7th edition foils or certain survival of the fittest promo before they close the loophole foil. You know, there's certain exceptions up to the to the policy but overall i still kind of you know i kind of try to steer clear of that so last question on here is something i always get on these type of videos is rudy what's your end game yeah it's the same old question the speculation of rudy's end game is always by far the best most circulated question that's always the most sought after to answer thing you see it post on message boards, private groups, all these social media. If Rudy endlessly buys all these reserve list cards, but he never sells them, I don't understand what the end game is. Well, I'm going to lay you guys out. I'm going to give you what my actual plan is here. My actual plan with these reserve list cards in the future uh, to pretty much do this to the market, all I have to do is just essentially...